you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, hello, I'm Rebecca and I'm the curator at Hackney Museum and I'm here today to talk a bit about some of the amazing ancient archaeology that is in this area because it is an under-celebrated fact locally that Stoke Newington is an internationally, sorry, a nationally and internationally important site for the Paleolithic or as I call it the Old Stone Age in Britain. Um, if you speak to archaeologists over this time period, they all know Stoke Newington. They talk about it a lot. So I'm here to talk to you about it. Um, the, and what's more uh, important than talking about the finds, I've actually brought some with me. So we're going to uh, get them out and hopefully get your hands on a bit of our history today. Um, the, this sort of talk came out uh, to, partly to celebrate the current exhibition and partly to shamelessly promote it as well. So please do come visit. Um, it's called Hackney 300,000 BC, but I'm going to confess to you, could have been called this. <laughs> because in reality, all the archaeology I'm going to talk about today is really Stoke Newton and also a lot found um, just down the road, really, in Clapton. Uh, I'm just going to mention this because I've already had a few people go, what museum? <laughs> we are your local museum, even though we had the notate for Hackney, we tell the stories about Stoke Newington, uh, along with Hackney and Shoreditch. Um, we are on their street, just next to Hackney Town Hall. It is a lovely 30-minute walk. I've done it myself today. So you really have no excuse to come discover these wonderful um, artefacts I'm describing yourself. Uh, we are open till July um, until for this particular exhibition. And the rest of the time, general history is open Tuesdays to Saturdays. Please come along free to entry. So, this talk is called Stoke Newington 300,000 BC. I am aware that is far too many zeros to mean anything to anybody. So I've done a quick timeline here, and I'm hoping you'll join me in a little bit of audience participation. <laughs> so I'm going to try, and maybe I'm going to use the laser for this technology. Right, I'm going to start here, and I want you to yell out when you think that biologically modern humans, homo sapiens, you and me in this room, when did we first get to Britain? Okay, don't be shy, just yell out when you think we're there. Any takers? There? More, more, so you like more if you think more? We're going to settle? More here? More? Yeah, no, settle? About there? It's all the way over there. We've got quite a while till we get to this exhibition. Also raises questions if it's not modern humans, who am I going to talk about today? Okay, one more time, one more point on this map. When do you think biologically modern humans, you and me, Homo sapiens, First of all, in Africa. Okay? Again, shout out when you're ready. There. There? Yeah. Do people more? What's the consensus? Yeah. More? Yeah. Less? Here? Yes. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> Over here. Some people put it a bit further this way. So, as you can see, some people have it that it was about 100,000 years before we even existed, is the archaeology we're going to talk about in Stoke Newton today. The other context I'd like to give is often with really ancient stuff, they talk about the Ice Age. And what they mean by that is this first blue line over here. That's what they call the Ice Age. We're talking about a history so old, there's been six Ice Ages between now and then. Um, and I want to bring that up because when you get an Ice Age, you get glaciers moving slowly but very strongly across the landscape and pretty much destroying often all the archaeology that's come before. And part of the reason that Stoke Newton is so important to understanding this is because it was one of the first and still one of the best places that we had this preserved layer of human activity that wasn't destroyed by the, the sort of activities of the glaciers above it. Um, so this was, I mean, really Stoke Newton was one of the first times they found items in situ, in context, as it was dropped by people hundreds of thousands of years ago, often as sharp as the, the tools were made. So that's part of the reason people are so excited about Stoke Newington. So, 300,000 years ago, what was Stoke Newington like? Different. <laughs> <laughs> I will confess, this is actually a reconstruction of what they think Norfolk was like about 500, uh, about half a million years ago, but it's a pretty good stand-in for Stoke Newington. You could even imagine this is the ancient and now gone Hackney Brook. <laughs> So the, the climate was very different. Um, summers were about three degrees warmer, but winters were colder. The landscape, they describe a bit like an African savanna today. So lots of open grasslands with a bit of woodland and marshlands thrown in. And we had very different animals, as you can see. So even just to say for Abney Park, they found some wolves, they found some rhinos. 
and uh, they found some sort of species of ancient horses. And I don't know if you can see this, these in the background there. So, um, in 1960, the new Evering Road sewer was being built. So just sort of between the Rectory Road Railway Bridge and Moorey Road, so this stretch here. So not perfect, but if you know the area, if you're walking to Rectory Road Station, this is where we're talking about. And there, they, when they were digging about 20 feet down, they noticed some interesting bones. Uh, so they found an ancient horse, they found part of a rhino, and my particular favorite, the straight tusked elephant. <laughs> the straight tusked elephant is believed to be the largest ever land mammal. It is very hard to express how big these are. So if you can think about an elephant today, double it. You would probably come up to about here, their knees. Uh, or if you think about, if you look at one of your double decker buses on your way home, it would be taller than that. These were massive and they found one just by Rector Road Station, and you can see it at the museum. <laughs> um, so as you can see, very different animals, very different Stoke Newington. But it's not just the animals that are interesting, what's really important is, well, I'm just going to stress about how important Stoke Newington is to our understanding of the time period. So if you've been to the Museum of London, they used to cover that time period with this. It is a recreation of a Stoke Newington campsite. And then their later displays, and if there's any Stoke Newington user groups, I, members, I borrowed this photo from you. This is the old display, so I think they've just taken them all down with the redevelopment. And this is all Springfield Park, Abney Park, I think one is Clapton. If you go to the prehistory displays, it's all local to here. Um, and part of that is because they just found so many. They found over 3,000 artifacts from this time period in this local area. Um, I would have loved to create a very detailed, loving map about where they were all found, but I didn't quite have the capacity. Um, and in particular, the artifact I want to talk about now is called the hand axe. The hand axe is a bit of a stupid term, uh, because it's not an axe, um, but it would have been held in the hand. I've got a couple here, I'm going to ask for a helper. Um, could somebody run one of these down to the back for me? These are genuine, about 300,000 years old. Don't drop it. Don't, don't, well, don't drop it, and if we can pass one at the front here, and if you could just hand it round. A uh, better way to think about hand axes is they were basically the Swiss army knife of the day. They would have been used for, you know, skinning animals, for digging, um, for potentially chopping, pretty much anything you'd need a sharp edge for, this is what they, they would have used. And we found an awful lot of them locally. Um, this is a guide to some of the main find sites locally. Um, so I don't know any reference points. So you've got Abney Park there and Stoke Newington High Street. I don't know if anybody recognises any of their streets. Um, I will do a shout out now. If you or anybody you know live on one of these streets, I have, please reach out to me via the museum or via Mir. I know some archaeologists who really want to talk to you <laughs> <laughs> about potentially putting a borehole in your garden and potentially revolutionising our understandings of this time period. So if you know people, spread the word. Let's make this happen. Um, so, who made them? Because it wasn't us. These were going to be, so based on just who was around at the time and based on what we know about the technology, um, these would have been made by Neanderthals. Now, Neanderthals um, were around from about 400,000 years to 40,000 years ago. They were around for an awful long time. Uh, that's, that's far more than Homo sapiens, us, have ever been in existence. We've got a while to go before we beat their record. And they actually stretch a really large part of the world. So you, we find evidence in the Antwerp all the way to the border of China and down in the Middle East, right through to Wales. So they were hugely successful at surviving in different climates, which is odd because now we use the phrase Neanderthal to mean basic or primitive. Um, Neanderthals and humans actually did live side by side near the end of their existence. Uh, and we even know now that they had children together. Um, and a lot of people now have Neanderthal DNA. Basically, if, you, if you're anything but sub-Saharan ancestry, you will have Neanderthal DNA, it's pretty much certain. Um, so yeah, very interesting. We're getting a lot of news stories now, constant new discoveries about the Neanderthals and what they can do and might it be changing our perceptions. Uh, you still get a lot of this imagery when you search Neanderthal, and I have to use this platform now to tell you this thing, a club, archaeology doesn't exist. We haven't found a single one. <laughs> <laughs> 
when Neanderthal fossils were being discovered, and it became very clear early on that we didn't evolve from them, there was a kind of desire to think that they were lesser. They weren't part of our story, so they had to be less clever. And what's the most simple thing you can think of somebody using? It's a club, and they still haven't shaken off that idea. Whereas the tools that are working around the room at the moment um, are very beautiful and very complicated. And what we find in Stoke Newton can tell us a lot about Neanderthals. So first of all, they don't need to be this beautiful. They don't need to be symmetrical. They don't need to have this much moved off. All they need is a sharp edge. You can make a much simpler tool. But for some reason, they were really driven to make aesthetically pleasing items. And I've deliberately not put the photos of a lot of the stone tools we have on display because I want you to come to the museum. <laughs> but we've got some really impressive, amazing ones. And this causes a lot of speculation about why they were doing this. And some people even argue that they represent the first form of art. Um, other people think it was a way of impressing members of the opposite sex. Um, that's a popular theory going around. But I find it really interesting to see that that, that very human tendency existed in other humans as well to want to create something pretty. Um, I want to just see if this can... Do you reckon it works? Just in case people can't really understand how these things are made, um, it's for a process called flint mapping. Now, this, again, it's not the, trying to go against that idea of the club and these people being very simple. To make these things, uh, it can be done in about 15 minutes, but it takes skill. You need to understand stone. You need to know where to find the right type of flint. You need to have a variety of tools and, and have a plan in your mind before you start. So this is just a, um, I don't know how it's going, but it's an example of how they make them. So basically, whoever's got the hand axe in their hand at the moment, again, this is evidence that these people were clever, they knew what they're doing, and they're very skilled. But it's called the Stone Age, and we talk a lot about stone tools, and that's because this is such a long time ago that it's the pretty much the only thing that survives. Um, and I'm, I'm including the people. We have very few, very little limited actual uh, physical evidence of Neanderthals in this country. And if we didn't have the stone tools, it probably taken us a lot longer to work out that we had this prehistory going this far back in this country. But Stoke Newton does have some surviving wood items, which is very exciting for archaeologists because we rarely get to see it. Um, so uh, here in Stoke Newton Common, there's an example of a bit of wood worked wood. And one thing that gets the archaeologists really excited is they discovered um, just here, so where is it? Um, so using again Rectory Road here and Stoke Newton Common up here, you've got Baston Road. And we're sort of talking about here. So there's another, if you know the road, where we've got Tisson Road on the left there. What they found here were two sharpened, artificially sharpened wooden stakes that survived. Now, there's a lot of um, discussion about what these might be. Um, and what I find particularly interesting is the person that found them goes into great detail explaining this really dense, compact amount of fern leaves that were surrounding these stakes. Now, I don't know if anybody watches a bit of Bear Grylls, but that's when you start thinking, are we looking at something like this? Because we do, there is evidence of surviving very basic Neanderthal structures to kind of protect them from the wind. And it's not unreasonable to think that they would, when out and about, want to protect themselves from the elements. And if this is indeed part of a shelter that somebody's made, it's pretty much the earliest known example of wood being used for a building structure that we know of. So very exciting, but it's very hard to prove. The other popular theory is that they represent some form of spear or jabbing or digging stick. And we certainly have an, enough examples to draw upon. So um, in Fact and Unseen Essex, there is a spear tip dating from 400,000 years ago. We know people have been hunting with spears for half a million years. And in Germany, in northern Germany, we do actually have several examples of really fine like javelin-style spears. So we do know Neanderthals did use wooden spears. So potentially, we're looking at this happening around here. 
And there's a particular reason I use this image, because in Stoke Newington, we have the extremely rare discovery of a mammoth kill site. And I can't tell you exactly where this was found, because the note keeping wasn't great, but it was definitely Stoke Newington. They found this mammoth scapula, and then resting directly on it when they discovered was one of the flint tools that we talked about. And you're not really going to get a clearer evidence of a, um, ancient people hunting mammoths than that. So that's a, quite a rare thing to be found. It went to the British Museum, and now no one knows where it is, unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> All right, so why is Stoke Newington so important? Um, beyond the fact that we just have a lot of it survived, and there's so many lots of it that's been found. And it's this sort of circumstance where a lot of factors come together. Now, attending these talks, you're probably aware that in the late 1800s, there was this incredibly rapid development of the area and this house building that took place at the time. Um, not to mention also industries like brick fields that all involved digging quite deep. But this development happened at a time when intellectuals had only just suddenly had made massive leaps in geology, paleontology, and just kind of realized how old humans were. And this is happening at just this perfect time when everybody's doing a lot of very deep digging in Stoke Newington, including for all the basements and sewer works for all these houses that were built up. So, so that was just coming up to sort of the start of the 1870s when the collectors start to start investigating this area. And this is uh, 1894, so a very quick turnaround of houses being built. The other factor that we need to include is one particular individual, Worthington George Smith. Um, he's one of these great eccentrics and great obsessive personality types that we owe so much to. Um, if he'd never discovered archaeology, um, he would have become very famous in his own right as an illustrator. Um, he, he already quite had a steady career as an architect and for producing these really beautiful um, illustrations of botanical works. And also you can see um, local, um, though he was originally in Shoreditch. Um, and so, one Smith was very interested when this first book, so I think it was called, um, John Evans' Ancient Man and His Works, to discover that they'd found these ancient implements just north of his house where he lived in Shoreditch at the time. And he began this campaign of day, so like Amir's eBay checks, every day walking the local construction sites to see what he could find. Um, and he, was, he did this for years, and he did it in secret because he didn't tell people what he was up to. Um, and then he started to investigate the building work that was happening in Stoke Newington, and that's where he made his really famous discovery of what they call his Paleolithic floor, which is this, um, this preserved context of um, artifacts and animals. And this was, again, this was the 1870s. This was like pretty much one of the two first discoveries of these things being found in context. This made a huge impact on our understanding of the old Stone Age, and we were so lucky with him, because unlike everybody else who was interested in this topic at the time, he kept incredibly detailed notes. He kept everything to the point that his house was so full of objects, he used to offer them free for people for the price of postage. And when people came to do uh, um, history tours uh, around the area, he would um, like offer them stone tools as like goodie, goodie bags at the end, so please take it. <laughs> um, he was also really pioneering in what he did, not only for the records he kept, but he was one of the first people to start using um, photography in an archaeological context. Um, you can see he is here, um, pointing at I, what I believe is a bit there. Um, he also enjoyed things like uh, early experimental archaeology. There's some great photos of him dressed up as he views his ancient man. Um, and he, some really pioneering techniques that we still use today, so refitting the, um, the flint flakes together to understand what went with what and how things were made. And not quote me on this, because it's slightly, I can't remember exactly if it's Abney Park, but he was actually able to find by carefully looking at each flint flake that this one part of a broken tool was about 20 feet away from the rest of it. And you have this wonderful scene of a Neanderthal trying to make the stone tool and it's breaking and in frustration, lobbing it <laughs> far away. <laughs> Little things like that being observed by his um, careful observation. So he published his discoveries in this book called Man, the Primeval Savage. It made a huge impact and you have all the collectors interested in this topic flooding Stoke Newington and poking around it and doing their collections. Um, we've now got stuff in our collection that were collected by Essex publicans who uh, clearly influenced by uh, Worm Smith and his work. 
wanted to come, have a look and find some Stoke Newton material themselves. Um, and the really lovely thing about Wormsley Smith is not only his detailed writing about all that he found, uh, but being an illustrator, he used to actually um, like to do these recreations of what he thought the past looked like. Now, admittedly, they do look a bit elf-like at times, or werewolf, but um, very progressive for the time, he would draw women being sewed, making stone tools, which I must admit, kind of took everybody another 100 years or so to have that radical idea that women were making these tools as well. Though, having looked at a lot of his work, I do notice if he could draw a topless person, he would, <laughs> so I don't know if that influenced his decision. Um, I would love to talk more about Wormsley Smith and some of the other amazing collectors that were active in Stoke Newton at the time. There is a fabulous soap drama of egos and personalities and rivalries and people getting threatened to be beaten up by local workers. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the scope to talk about that today, um, but there are some amazing people out there. If anybody else wants to know, would, I'm sure I'd be happy to talk or um, there is wonderful articles we can direct you to as well. Um, I'm going to wrap up, but I want to say... This exhibition, Hackney 300,000 BC, will be open until the 22nd of July. Please come see it while it's still up. Um, I also want to thank our supporters, the Royal Society and the National Lottery Heritage Fund, who supported us to do this research, to do this work, and come out and speak to you today. I um, also want to do us out for Amir, who um, connected us with one of the researchers which supported on this and basically populated the entire section of the exhibition, so Amir was very helpful. Um, thank you very much, and please let me know if you have any questions.